Today we're in the book of Isaiah. We've been talking about God the judge, and that's because much of the book of Isaiah talks about God's judgment. Now we could skip that part, but we don't skip the hard parts of the Bible here. We preach them. We tell the truth. And that wasn't just judgment in the Old Testament. That's God saying, listen, I'm patient, I'm loving, I want all to be saved, I'm giving time. He wants us to reach out and love people so they can find him. But it makes sense when you look at this world and the wickedness and the evil and the war and the injustice and everything that's happening, that even though God is patient and he's long-suffering, he's just, that one day, and it's talking about the end times in Isaiah, it's prophecy, we've been preaching about it, one day... He will come and he will catch his people away, those who've been faithful, and his judgment will fall on the wicked in this world because they've had every chance and they've turned against him. That's just the truth. Uh, and and it, 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 we need to be reoriented in our theology these days because we've taken God's judgment completely out of the Bible. You can't do that. That's, there's a Hamiltonian Bible, and that's where, where Hamilton, one of our politicians in the early years of America, took out all the parts that he didn't like of the Bible, and he just left parts. You can find it online, Hamilton Bible. He just took out the parts that, that are easy to deal with, and, and, and that's how a lot of Christians are, but we deal with everything here. But today, I'm pretty excited because we're coming to the second half of the book Isaiah, of Isaiah, and it's just like Old Testament, New Testament, and Isaiah. Here we go. God's promises to all who will follow him. We see about the grace of God. After spending weeks on the justice and wrath of God, that will happen someday. Justice will mean that wrath must be meted out for wickedness that's been performed. But we now turn our attention in this book to what God's purpose is, grace and bringing salvation to everyone. So we're looking at Isaiah 42, verses uh, 13 through Isaiah um, 44, 20 today. We're not going to read every scripture, but we're, we're looking at it as it speaks about God's, God being a warrior, God being a loving redeemer, and showing his unwavering commitment to these people who've consistently fallen short and sinned and sinned and sinned. He reaches to them with love. That's a sign and a shadow for us today. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's not one of us that can stand up and say, you know, we're completely righteous. The Bible says not even one. But we can all speak of the grace of God and we can all start to follow in loving obedience because he's done so much for us. And we can get closer and closer to him all the time. It's a great invitation that God gives every person. Come close to me and I will come close to you. We're going to talk about his mercy and grace today. You may have heard this, but let us put it on the screen for you. Grace is getting what we don't deserve. The grace of God, we don't deserve it. Mercy is not getting what we do deserve. And we're talking about mercy today with the people of Israel in this passage. They had gone to idols. They had turned away from God. They had spit in his face. Did you see one of the Oregon Ducks got expelled from a game because he spit in someone's face? There are people who spit in God's face and say, I don't, I don't like you. I don't care about you. Get away from me. And the Ducks won, by the way, and I'm happy about that. But, uh, but uh, you, know, I just, you know what I said about that boy? That boy wasn't raised right. What happened there? Uh, but Coach will talk to him. Coach is a good Christian guy. And so I'm, the Holy Spirit's going to leave me if I don't get back to this because I'm not sure he wants me to talk about the Ducks today. All right, but he's, he's merciful, and he's meeting these people. Even though they've made all these mistakes and turned against him over and over again, we see the heart of God. He keeps coming to you with his love. He keeps coming with his grace and his mercy. And it's really the beautiful part of the book. As a matter of fact, chapters 40 through 42 are actually called by theologians. It's prophecy about God. This section in, in Isaiah is called the books of comfort. Books of comfort, that he would comfort us and care about us. And, and love us. He's reassuring his people about his promises that he will deliver and restore them. We got some extra music going on here. <laughs> Worship's over. Okay. All right. There we go. <clears throat> I, I've done it before. I've done it before. I Listen, I'm just ADD. I mean, you know, a birdie. That, I, I just, I, I need, be quiet. I need to concentrate. Okay. <clears throat> So let's look at these three promises right here. Number one, I love this. I think we take this away from Jesus. God promises to be a warrior who defends you. 
I like the warrior stuff in the Bible. You take the warrior out of Jesus, you've taken some of the best away. You've taken his strength. You've taken his power. You've taken his almighty knowledge, and everything is under his control. You take the warrior away, then you, you just made him mamby-pamby where people can walk on him, and he's not in charge. He is in charge. He's loving, but he's in charge. He's patient, and he's waiting. Here, here it is, Isaiah 42, 13. The Lord will march out like a champion. It's hard for me not to shout when, this, when I read this. Like a warrior, he will stir up his zeal. And with a shout, he will raise the battle cry and will triumph over his enemies. Now, listen, this is written to the people, the children of Israel. It's written to them, but it's written for us as well, right? It was true in that day that he was prophesying that he's going to redeem the nation of Israel. <laughs> but it's true for us personally. That they're just a depiction of us in a way where they're on a journey trying to get closer to God and they're messing up, but he keeps reaching. That's kind of us in some ways, but, but it's for us too. He's not only a warrior for Israel, he's a warrior for the Gentiles. That's us. He's a warrior for all of us personally. Proverbs 2, 7 says, he stores up wisdom for those who are honest. Like a shield, he protects the innocent. He makes sure that justice is done. We talked about that. And he protects those who are loyal to him. The Hebrew word for warrior here um, in, in the Bible is, in the New Testament, is hero, a mighty man, a person with great physical strength. It's just like, you know, that person coming in to, that, that is strong and powerful to change all the circumstances and you win. So my friend Donnie Moore uh, had an experience once that I want to tell you about. He was at a gas station in Stockton, which is where he lived. Stockton's rough. I don't know if you know California, but Stockton's about the roughest town you could be in. A lot of gangs, a lot of stuff going on there. And Donnie lived in that town, ministered in the prisons all around there. And, and uh, so he was getting his gas and he saw that there was a person who he perceived could be a gang member, wasn't sure, but he was intimidating this young lady. And he was saying vile things to her. Now, if you don't know Donnie Moore, let me tell you that when he was 60 years old, he benched 515 pounds. He's a strong dude. That is a lot of weight. There are guys in the NFL, there, there, there might be 10% of those athletes or less, 5% that can bench 500 pounds. And, and so, so he is a stallion the, uh, and, and, and he's strong. And he's a, he's a righteous dude, but he sees this guy intimidating this young lady. And so he walks over and walks in with this young lady, and he says, you okay? And she goes, I'm afraid. And um, so she gets her stuff, and that guy comes back, and he's waiting for her to come out at the door, this guy that was intimidating her, saying sexual and vile things. And she, she said, I'm afraid he's going to try to take me or something. So Donnie said, I'll walk out with you. So he, he walks out with this young lady, doesn't know her. He walks out in the station, and this guy starts it up again. And Donnie steps in front of the lady in between this guy, and he said, back off brother. And the guy said, who's going to stop me? You going to stop me? And Donnie said, yeah, I'm going to stop you. And Donnie said, that guy reached in his pocket like this. And this is what Donnie told me. The Lord told him he had a knife. So when that guy reached in his pocket before he pulled it out, Donnie popped him and knocked him cold. He's laying in the parking lot. And, and you say, how is this spiritual? God's a mighty warrior. Let me get through it. All right. <laughs> And the police come, and Donnie stays, and, and the guy's still out. He's not dead, but he's out. You know, I mean, 515 pounds and 220 pounds, all of it, you know, is going right through this guy's face. And, and uh, the police say, what happened here? And the lady says, this guy was, and I was scared to death. She's still trembling, and this guy stepped in, and he helped me. And the, the guy behind the counter says, yeah, man, that's the way it was. We were watching and, and the policeman looks at Donnie and he says, are you Donnie Moore? <laughs> he said, yes, sir, I am. He said, Donnie Moore, the preacher? He said, uh, yes, sir, I am. He said, you better get out of here right now. I'll take care of this stuff, all right? You just go. Well, you know, Donnie was rescuing that young lady. He was protecting her. And it was a knife, by the way. That, they, that he got it out, but he didn't get it moving because Donnie knocked him out. Well, that's physical, but spiritually, listen, you get in some tough situations, you're in a hard place right now, 
It looks like the circumstances against you and you're not going to win. Let me tell you who the mighty warrior is. The mighty warrior is Jesus Christ. He struck an amazing blow at the cross when he destroyed the power of the enemy, the authority of the devil. And the devil comes to wreak havoc in your life. There is a devil. If there's a God, there's a devil. The Bible makes sure. The difference about that we know that. But the difference in God is he's omniscient. He's all-knowing. He's all-powerful. He's everywhere. He's omnipresent. But the devil, he's just got a number of demons under his control. They're not everywhere. They don't do everything. But sometimes they hassle us. And sometimes they cause grief. And we don't even know where it's coming from. But what I want you to know is you have a mighty warrior who will stand for you. You've got Jesus Christ who will step between you and the one who's trying to destroy you and your family. Who's trying to break relationships and make everything as bad as he can make it. He comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. But God has come to give life and give it abundantly. Second Thessalonians 3. Yeah, let me say that again and let's clap. God has come to give life and to give it abundantly. He's the mighty warrior. Yes. Come on, man. He doesn't just fight for me. He doesn't just fight for us. Take your finger and do this and say it with me. He fights for me. The warrior fights for me, okay? He's on your side and he loves you. Second Thessalonians 3, 3, but the Lord is faithful and give you strength and will protect you from the evil one. Jesus is that mighty warrior. Secondly, we see here today these promises in Isaiah, the book of comfort. God promises to redeem and restore you. Let me just say, some of us have just been messed up. Even Christians, we've just kind of been messed up by our families. Like, like we're just all broken. The, the older I get, the more I realize there's none of us who have it all together, completely all together. We're all people who are broken and forgiven and moving towards Jesus and getting our healing more and more and becoming more like him. But man, we even stumble and fall. We just need Jesus every day. But some of us, you may have had something in your background where there was anger. There was someone who was absent, who didn't love. And, and you, you, you say, I don't want to be like that. But you find yourself being like that as you go. And then you feel like, well, I'm worthless and I don't deserve God. And listen, if anyone, any peoples didn't deserve God, it's these people. Continually turning against God, picking up other gods, idols. They're picking up idols, just wood and silver statues that they go in and have custom made. And then they're worshiping these things that can do nothing. And, and they're not worshiping the God who's given them everything. And, and that can be us too. But look what he says in Isaiah 43. But now, this is what the Lord says. He who created you. Jacob, he who forms you. Israel. And, and it's to Israel again, but it's for us too, these promises. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. I, you know, I know it sounds weird, but he knows your name. God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit knows your name. He's intimately acquainted with you. He created you. He knows how many hairs are, are, in, are, are on your, the top of your head, and you lose 100 to 300 hairs a day. And so if he knows that, he knows this, he, the Bible says he cares about the bird when it falls, the sparrow, that little single bird that, that no one cares about. When that falls to the ground and dies, it has no soul, but God cares about that. And the Bible says, how much more does he care about you? He loves you so much. He knows you. And yet we, we tend to think, man, I've messed up so much. He doesn't want me. Listen, I wrestled with that when I was a young man because I had turned against God. I was raised the right way and turned against the Lord and went out into the world, much like the prodigal in the Bible. And the thing I found that just amazed me, I didn't know about him in my youth. It's how loving he is, how forgiving he is, how much grace and mercy is there. Like these guys messed up over and over again and he kept reaching with his love. And so if you think you've gone too far, let me just be a witness personally. Let this word, let this people be a witness to you. He will redeem and restore you. All the brokenness. Some of you had such pain, not even caused by yourself, caused by others. It makes you wonder if he cares about you, but he does. He loves you. And you can be the one who changes it for the next generation. It doesn't have to go the way it went before. God can redeem you and restore you and, 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 and help your family as you go forward in incredible ways. He says, I'm the redeemer. I know your name. In your toughest trial, I'm going to be there for you. In that fiery place, I'm going to be there for you. Let me pick it up uh, again. 
Um, do not fear, I've redeemed you, I've summoned you by name, and you are mine. Go back to that scripture, please. Verse 2, when you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. When you pass through the rivers, these are challenges in life. They will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, oh man, if I had to raise your hand, some of you are going through a fire right now. You're just going through a trial. <clears throat> but this is a promise, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you abl ablaze, for I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. This comes right off the heels of God saying to the people <clears throat> in previous chapters in Isaiah, you, you've forsaken me by going to idols. And that's the people he's saying these words to. But I love you. I, my hand is towards you. I'm going to redeem and restore you. Now, the thing is, you have to say yes to God. You want all that God has, give him all that you have, right? Give him, give him your whole life. Some people say, when's that abundant life kick in? I don't get it. Well, there's no perfect life here. This isn't heaven. But that joy and that peace kicks in when you, when you turn towards him and you start to follow him. And that joy and the peace can, can be in the midst of a trial. Not all the trials of life will be removed. But that comfort and the presence of the Holy Spirit and God taking your hand. You know, someone going through a great trial told me the other day, just pain continually. And she was an older woman. She said, I'm just getting so close to the Lord because of this pain. What? She said, I get up every morning and I tell him I need him. I say, God, meet me. Meet me because I'm hurting. And then I feel his presence and his comfort. And guess what? The pain hasn't gone away. And yet his presence is there and his peace is there. And she said this, I'm closer to the Lord than I've ever been. Well, you say, you know, I'd like to get close to him without pain. And I'm with you on that, all right? Without pain. But you can't escape pain in this life. And you can reject that hand coming to yours to comfort you. But here's what he's promised you. Here, there, or in the air, it's going to be resolved. He, he's got you. He loves you. His healing can come. And, and we're going to pray for healing in this church as we go, because we've seen it. Some instantaneous healing. But perseverance says, I trust him, and I'm going to keep my hand in his. And that woman found the beauty of God's presence as she walks through that trial. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The king said, I see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire. But there's a fourth one who looks like the son of God. I always think, what? They don't even know about Jesus yet. And they, they said it looks like the Son of God walking with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego through that fire. They were cast in there because they wouldn't bow down to the idol of the king, the world's idols. And, and, and the Bible says that the only thing that burned, that their, their flesh wasn't burned, their clothes weren't burned, they're in the fire. It's a, it's a physical miracle. Was the ropes that bound them. That's what burned in the fire. So we may walk through the fire, but I'm going to tell you, just don't go alone. Take him with you, because he'll bring you through it. And on the other side of it, you'll be a testimony for what God has done. So, so we see that they've been unfaithful. Sometimes we've been unfaithful. They've chosen idols. You say, well, I, I, I don't do idols. Well, I think we, and let me just talk about that for a moment. Because we're trying to draw close to God. <clears throat> he's given us a promise, but he's saying to these people, let go of the idols. Let go of the idols and take hold of me. Those idols can give you nothing. So, so some idols are demonic. And we're not aware of it. Let me just read you some things. I, I'm amazed at how Christians don't know these things are off and you can't get involved in them. And the only reason we don't know is because we don't read the Bible enough. And maybe preachers don't bring it enough. But look what it says in Deuteronomy. And you can find testimony to this in the New Testament too. Talking about idols. And do not let your people practice fortune telling <clears throat> or sorcery. Totally off base, all these things. They're demonic. Or interpret omens or engage in witchcraft. There's no white witchcraft and black witchcraft. It's witch, all witchcraft is bad. It's bad. It's, it's, de, it's demonic presence that attends it. Or cast spells or functions as mediums or psychics or call forth the spirits of the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord. So, you know, if you pick up those things, what it means is you're looking to something other than God when he's the one who's all powerful, and they, they can't help you. They're just liars. Can I tell you what? If there's an evil spirit that speaks and they can do it at time, can I tell you something? They can only tell you about what's happened in the past because that's all they know. They're not all powerful. They, they can't even tell you what's going forward because they're, it, they don't want to talk about the future because there's total defeat for, for the demonic in the future, right? Jesus is going to overcome in every way when he sets his foot down. And so, Sometimes the idols are not only so 
obvious like that, but they can be some that are, there, there are some that are deceptive. And um, we don't know uh, what, what they are, but let me just tell you, what's an idol? An idol is something that if it's removed from you, you feel hopeless and helpless. Mm. So, you know, money. You feel hopeless and helpless if you don't have it? Um, I'm talking about things that can become idols. A person. Now listen, I believe God wants us to have fellowship and relationship, and there are good things about this. <clears throat> but but I, I, I tell Karen, I hope this doesn't sound bad. I love her so much. I say, I say, you know, I have to push you down every now and then to make sure Jesus is on top of everything here. Just because I love her so much. You can, you can make your spouse <clears throat> an idol where your dependence is there and, and not on, on the Lord. And she, she said, no, you don't have to worry about that. That's what she said to me. She wants me to love Jesus more than anything else because she knows that I'll be the kind of man God wants me to be if that's where my heart is. Your reputation can be an idol. You won't share about Jesus because of your reputation sometimes when the Holy Spirit says, right here, I got a moment for you to talk to these people. You think, oh, no, I don't want to be seen as. <sighs> here we go. I'm a sports guy. Remember this. Sports can be an idol. Sports can be an idol. If it means that your time and effort are put there in such a way that it has power that keeps you away from God, it can be an idol. Whew. I'm not saying sports are an idol. You don't have to put them there. You can just enjoy them as entertainment. That's fine. But fellas, come on, man. Let's talk about it. How much time do we give the Lord and how much time do we give sports? TV, on the field. Ooh, hope you come back. I love you. Hope you come back. I like sports. Sports have done nothing but disappoint me because I'm a Dallas Cowboy fan. <laughs> 27 years of vanity, striving for wind. <clears throat> and yet, it, it, I mean, do we live and die by this stuff? I, I'm amazed at men that won't come and raise their hands in the sanctuary but look like a blooming idiot when they watch a football game. You know, you know what I mean? Ah! Whoa! Yeah! But like that, that's too much. Don't do that for God. That is just too much. Whoa! Yes! Yes! What? What? That's a football fan, right? Karen's saying, that's you every now and then, Stan. That's what she's saying to me right now. And we... We can't do that, you know, it's just too much, you know, I'm a man. Come on, man, come on, give him everything. First John 5.21 says, dear children, keep yourselves from idols. Gambling can be an idol, it takes you over. I'm concerned about sports and gambling. Every time I see that so nonchalant on everything on TV today, Dude, let me tell you, we work with people all the time whose families are destroyed because of gambling. Whew, be careful. Be careful. I say people who gamble, who gamble are mathematically challenged. Those people are going to win eventually that do that stuff on the cruises and everywhere, you know. I'm not, unbalanced scales is what the Bible says. And I'm not even saying you can't do it. I'm just saying don't, you be super careful, super careful. Because the enemy knows how to get a hook in your nose, all right? And um, what else could it be? It could be, it could be sexual sin, pornography. It takes you over. It keeps you from God. It keeps you from being the man of God, the person that God wants you to be. It can be alcohol. It can take you over. Be, oh, be careful. Drugs. Man, we know that some of the people we love so much, here's the way I look at it. I have compassion for people who are alcoholics and drug addicts. I think God has compassion. I, I don't like it when we start to think those are bad people and we're good people. What? Come on, man. Where would Jesus be? Who would he love? Who would he reach to? And the way I look at it is they're stolen from us by the enemy. They're stolen. They, they, they got this addiction and they were stolen away from us. But in there somewhere is that, that original person who, who needs love. And if we don't love them, then they're not going to have as much chance to break it off, right? To break it off and to help. And, and I know that's, that's hard. But, but the point here is don't, don't, don't say I can, you know, I can handle my alcohol. I can, 
you know, six or seven beers is, is you know, I, it doesn't affect me. I don't know. Just be careful, man. These things can become idols. But then notice here that God has said to all these people who, are, who have these physical idols, listen, where he doesn't leave it there. Like, these are bad things and you're a bad person. Nope, that's not what he's saying. He says, I will rescue you. You, you, got, you got trouble? He will rescue you. He'll rescue you from the, the flood. He'll forgive you. He'll redeem you. He'll, he'll make it beautiful. Here's Isaiah 1, 18, and it's hard not to shout when I read this too. Come now. This is the Old Testament, man, but it's Jesus. It's the crimson thread right here working through Isaiah. They say the Old Testament has the crimson thread woven all through it. That's the, that's the story of Jesus, okay, the crimson thread. Come now, let us settle this, says the Lord. He's talking to his people. He's talking to you and me. Though your sins are like scarlet, that means they're red and terrible. I will make them as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, I will make them as white as wool. That's what the Lord says. The Lord Almighty, who's loving and forgiving, says, I can make you brand new. I, 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 people don't get salvation. It's really the greatest testimony that there is a God, the way a life has changed, isn't it? People can say whatever they want, but my dad once smoked and drank and gambled big time, and when he got saved, all of that stopped. And he started going to church, and my dad for 50 years was a changed man, redeemed, getting more like Jesus every day. And he had a lot, to, a lot of bad things to get out of his life from where he came from. But he followed Jesus and eventually went into the ministry and eventually ministered to some of you, and he was redeemed and restored. Yeah, I think we're afraid to say where we came from and God doesn't get the glory for, for what he's done in our lives sometimes. Your testimony will show people how awesome Jesus is. Tell them where you came from. Tell them that you once had a problem with this and a problem with that, but God came in. Tell them that people came alongside you and helped you. Your testimony is powerful. He says, I'll make, you, I'll make these sins as white as wool. He's calling you to himself. His ultimate desire is for you to learn from your mistakes, for us to come closer to him. His grace is calling us deeper into communion with him. He's forgiven us, and it makes us love him all the more. Despite our failures, his redemptive love keeps reaching for us. That's what we see with the children of Israel, right? He just keeps reaching. I heard a story the other day that I loved. I want to relate to you. It's from um, Pastor Josh White, a book that he wrote called Stumbling Toward Eternity. And he pastors in um, Portland, um, Northeast Portland. And he tells the story of his dad in his book. <clears throat> his dad and mom were married at 20 and 19, and they were divorced before he was one. His dad was a drug addict and an alcoholic and um, a drug dealer. So his mom kept him from his dad uh, for most of his life. Uh, every now and then he'd see him, but his dad and he would eventually argue junior high, high school, and he hated his dad. This is before he was saved. He hated his dad. And uh, he, didn't, he didn't want to have anything to do with his dad. Well, then he gets saved, and, you know, God redeems him, and he was pretty bad. He was into drugs, too, when he got saved. And God redeemed him and changed him, and he still doesn't like his dad at all, might hate him. And then he becomes a pastor, and he's like, this probably shouldn't be that, that I don't like my dad very much, and I can't get over this. And so he thinks, okay, God redeem me. I'm going to reach out to my dad. So he reaches out to his dad. His dad's just a broken man. His dad is near death and, uh, you know, a couple decades before he should be. And through the talks, he invites his dad to meet his family. And he's afraid to bring his dad to meet his family because he's got a, God's given him a sweet little family and they're loving Jesus. And so he has a daughter whose name is Hattie. She's eight years old. And he says, Hattie, I've invited my dad to come see us, but he's, he's a hard man. You're going to see him smoking. And Hattie had a keen sense of righteousness, so she would have called him on it right away, right? And he said, now, he, Hattie said, he knows that'll kill him, right? She's eight. And he goes, yeah, but he doesn't care. He doesn't care. So don't say anything about dad smoking, okay? And she said, okay. So along the way, she's in a car. She's about to meet Grandpa Al. 
And eight-year-old Hattie says, Dad, I'm so excited to meet Grandpa. And she said, uh, I love Grandpa. And he's like, he said it wasn't his best pastoral or dad moment. He said, well, how do you even know you're going to like him? You haven't even met him. Because his dad had been mean, mean, mean to him. And she said, this is an eight-year-old from the mouths of babes. Well, he's my grandpa, and he's your dad, so I love him already. He said, okay. So he says they get there. Dad gets out. Dad has a walker now. And he's coming along slow. And Josh said, he looks like a more weathered version of Willie Nelson. Like, that's what he looks like. More weathered. Not, not saying more. And he could barely walk. And he's coming along. And Hattie runs out to meet him. And she said, hi, Grandpa. I'm Hattie. And he said, hello, little girl. Little lady. Nice to meet you. And she put her hand on his hand on the walker. And Al, who's now passed away but found Jesus later, said that when she touched me, it was like electricity went through my body. You know what I think he was, Josh didn't say this, but you know what I think he felt right there? He felt the unconditional love of God coming through a little girl. <clears throat> She said, Grandpa, Grandpa, come with me. And she led him to a place where they could sit down. And, and they sat down. And she said, Grandpa, I love you. And Josh is just kind of enduring this and kind of intrigued. Like, what, what's Dad going to say? What's going on here? And he said, well, I love you too, little lady. And then Josh said he pulled the cigarette out. And he lit it up. And um, by the way, people say, is... is Cigarette is, you know, is that a sin? I, we had a guy come to me once and said, uh, I can't stop smoking. Am, am I going to go to heaven? I said, he, bro, you're going to go to heaven. You just might get there sooner than the rest of us. That's what, I, that's what I told him. And he did, by the way. And it was that that took him. That, you know, I've been here 30 years. You see stuff. Great guy, though. I loved him. And so did God. But he pulls out a cigarette and he lights it up. And Hattie, this keen sense of righteousness, she looks at him. She looks at mom. And she looks at dad. And Josh is thinking, oh, man, she's going to do it. She's going to say something. And then she looks down at grandpa's boots. And she says this, grandpa, I love your boots. Josh said that that encounter is what he think changed his dad and brought his dad to a place where he eventually came to Jesus Christ. He's gone now. He's in heaven. If you see Willie Nelson up there, it may not be Willie. It may be Grandpa Al, okay? <laughs> but the grace of God, the grace of God. Be careful in this political season. Listen, I'm for righteousness. I'm for, you know, righteousness exalts a nation. I, I'm probably more conservative than most of you, but it ain't about politics. It's about the love of God and Jesus Christ. And our mission, though, though, you know, politics is a realm that we'd like to win in, that's not our main mission. Our main mission is for people to know and find out about the love of God, to present that to them accurately, to show them about the grace and the mercy of God. So like Grandpa Al, they can be there someday. If you're not a clapping congregation, I haven't led you to that. Let's go ahead and clap that Jesus redeems people, okay? <laughs> For everyone has sinned, Romans 3.23. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Now, I want you to notice the tense there. It doesn't say we have all fallen short. Some versions say that. But accurately, it says we fall short. Yeah, we still make mistakes, don't we? You know what I told an evangelist once? He said, give me some feedback. I said, bro, you have a lot of grace for unbelievers, but you don't have very much grace for the believer. Come on, man, we stumble. How do we get up? Only by being honest. If we act so righteous that people can't tell us what they're going through and they hide it, all we're going to do is help them stumble the wrong way and get hurt more. But if we're loving and forgiving and caring and we're there for them to pick them up, to walk with them, and we don't tell everybody what we know, you hear me on that? Love covers a multitude of sin. It doesn't mean that it hides everything. 
It means that you love so much that, and you love this person, person so much that you're with them. You know what they're dealing with. And they've got a couple people around them and, and you're willing to shelter them till they get there. Come on, man, let's go. Let's journey together. Let's do this. You can do it. Get up. It happened to me. Jesus redeemed me. Come on, let's go together. And I, I just, I just want to say this. I'm, every now and the word comes that's for the Lord, from the Lord for a congregation. Like much of this word's for the whole body of Christ, but this is for the congregation today. They're going to be coming, and they're broken and messed up. And here's a tough question. Not only can we minister to them, but can we bring them into our homes? That's the word. Can we love them so much that they get a seat at our table? Can we walk with them till they get there? Can we remember where we came from and help them get to where they need to be? Wow. Wow. Thirdly, I'm going to do this quick. God promises to pour out his Holy Spirit on you. So he's a warrior that will fight for you. He's the one who redeems and restores you. These are promises from God, but he promises to pour his Holy Spirit out on you. Look at this verse. For I will pour water on the thirsty land. This is Isaiah now. And streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. So this isn't just for you, it's for generations to come. It's for the children of Israel, it's for us too. Generations to come. You can change the generational curse from the past where they're all being hurt and wounded to coming to Jesus and and life being the covering that God would give you, life and health in your family. They will spring up like grass in meadow, like poplars by the flowing streams. It's, It's foretelling about the children of Israel, but it's telling about our stories too. This imagery of water and dry land, it's God's life-giving power, this restoration we're talking about. The outpouring of the Spirit is, is a glimpse of the new covenant that is coming. It's prophecy, the new covenant that is coming um, for the people of God when the Holy Spirit, uh, Jesus said, I'm leaving, but, I, but I'm, I'm sending you a comforter. Joel 2.28, it's, this passage is very similar in Isaiah. And afterward, I'll pour out my Spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Can I just say it said daughters too? I'm just throwing that out there. And prophecy is not just foretelling, it's forthtelling. Prophecy is preaching too. And and this is what it said. Okay, I won't go there. I did go there. Uh, Verse 29, even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And then John 14, the words of Jesus, and I will ask the Father, he will give you another advocate to help you, okay? Isaiah said, the Holy Spirit's coming. Jesus said, I, I was here for you, now I'm, I'm leaving, but, there's, but I'm leaving you the advocate to help you and be with you forever. Verse 17, the Spirit of truth, this is the Holy Spirit now. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him. For he will live with you and be in you. Unbelievable. When we get saved, the Holy Spirit comes into every believer's life. But that's not where it stops. That means we're not alone in our decision making and our guidance anymore. That, that we can look to God and when we pray and we look, he'll, he'll give us not only the answers in the Bible, but he'll give us guidance in our lives. Like even around who should I marry? He'll give you guidance. Uh, where should I work? He'll give you guidance. Where should I minister? He'll give you guidance. Where, where should I serve? He'll give you guidance. Should I move? He'll give you guidance. And sometimes we, we unwittingly are fighting against God because he's got something for us in his perfect will and we're seeking to do something else because we're not talking to him. We're not asking him. Okay, so here's what the paraclete, the, the, the counselor that Jesus is talking about. He said advocate, that's translated counselor in many of the versions of the Bible in the Greek. It's the word paraclete. The counselor or paraclete is God the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity who's been called to our side. That's what Jesus told us. He's a personal being and he indwells every believer. What's the work he does? This is some of the work of the Holy Spirit. It's so vast I can't speak of it all. But the paraclete, this is for you. He's in you. He's with you. You can seek him and more power will be released in your life. He's the comforter. The Holy Spirit's the encourager. He's the counselor. He's the advocate. He helps convict us. He's our helper in all the difficult situations. He gives direction and guidance. He sanctifies us and helps us get closer to Jesus. He intercedes for us. He heals us. He brings miracles into our lives. That's what you have in you as a believer. 
And you just need to say, okay, if you're here, then I'm going to take advantage of it. Help me to know you. What do you want me to do, Lord? Because I, I love the Bible. And 95% of what you need to know, maybe 99 is in the Bible. But there's some other stuff that the Holy Spirit would guide you in. What's his name? Right? What's her name? That, that special relationship. Where do I go? Let me just tell you about a few things real quick in my life that I've seen the Holy Spirit moving because I did not want to be a preacher. So I was kicking against the goads, as they say in the Bible. And I, part of my running was, I was a Jonah, man. I was fighting the call when I was young. But when I was a little guy, I'm at an altar. That means, you, altar means you bring people forward and you pray. They call it, you know, altar time. And, and, and I'm there and some people gather around me and someone prophesies over me and says, this, this young man's going to be a pastor. And then they all start praying and they pray in tongues. And then someone else says, oh, he's going to pastor a large church. Oh, the Lord's hand on him. And you know what I wanted to do? What? I wanted to go. Please, please, because this is not what I wanted, okay? And, and um, but it doesn't matter what I want. God loves me so much, he's trying to show me, right? And, and, and so you hide those things in your heart. And then, and then I remember when I first, I'm just talking about moments. I'm not going to necessarily tie them together. I remember the first time that I saw Karen at church. I'd seen her once before. And I thought, that's a beautiful woman. But I saw her at church, and I knew who her mom and dad was. And this was a Holy Spirit moment for me. This is what I believe. I said to myself, I've never said it before, that's a beautiful woman. She loves Jesus. She has great parents. She knows about the Holy Spirit. She's been raised in these things. And I thought to myself, I'd like to marry a woman like that someday. You know what? That was the Holy Spirit leading me and guiding me to Karen. That was my reward, part of my reward for coming back to him and giving him my all. He gave me someone precious. And then I remember coming here. Listen, I was a district youth director. This youth convention they talk about, we'd have 1,700 kids. I'd bring in speakers like Donnie Moore and people. We'd have the Holy Spirit fall. There'd be 400 kids, maybe 300. I did a little evangelism there, uh, exaggerating. 300 kids, Lord's checking me, but filled with the Holy Spirit and, and, um, in a moment. And, and it was so awesome. There's some of you who went to those as youth, uh, as youth, when I was there as a district youth director. They were great. They, they were great moments. And I love what I was doing. I, I think we had speakers speaking in Oregon, all over Oregon. And I think we had 3,500 kids saved in three years when we did assemblies at one segment in Oregon, all over the state. And um, man, it was just, it was dynamic. Karen and I traveled 30,000 miles a year in a car, and we were in a plane probably 10 or 12 times heading to other states. The Lord was using us in youth ministry, and we loved it. And one day I knelt down at my house in Kaiser, Oregon, and I said this to the Lord, Lord, I don't know what the next step is. You've always shown me, you've shown me the next step. I don't know what the next thing is. And I meant where I'm at with youth. And God said to me, you say, how do you know these things? Well, you get these impressions, but in retrospect, they prove themselves, okay? And I've really felt it was the Lord. Turns out it was. God spoke to me and said, what makes you think that is what I have for you? And it surprised me. And I said, well, if this is not what you have for me, because listen, my life is not my own. It's not mine to be used for my purposes. It's his to be used for his purposes. And I don't always get it right, but that's my heart to get there. <clears throat> I said, Lord, if you have something else for me, then just let me know. Next morning, one of the elders from Grace Community, that's Horizon now, this church, called me. That elder's sitting here in this service today. And he said, hey, uh, we need a new pastor. You've come to my mind and my heart. I believe the Lord would call you. And you know what I did? This was an old phone. One phone in the house and everybody would answer the one phone. That was that day. I, take, I took that phone and I turned it up like that because I didn't want him to hear me crying. Because the Lord was revealing to me in that moment, the Holy Spirit, that's where I'm taking you. This is what I have for you. I'm just telling you Holy Spirit moments because I want you to have them. 
I want you to have them because it's so personally amazing and wonderful. And God has them for you. The Holy Spirit is in you. The Holy Spirit wants to do a deeper work in you. His power, his direction released. And you say, well, man, I'm not as close as you. Listen, stop, stop. Some of you are more spiritual than me. You really are. Just, just submit your heart and humble and say, what, Lord? Help me. Show me. And if you don't get the whisper like I get, you, you'll get it confirmed through circumstances. But he is there for you. This may seem so weird and so ethereal to you. But, uh, okay, if you've experienced the Holy Spirit speaking to you and helping you as you move along in life, lift your hand up. He's talked to you. Okay, okay, I'm not crazy. See? See? It's all of us. But we got to remember, stand to your feet. <clears throat> I'm going to ask you to come down here to an altar. If you're going through a trial, if you need forgiveness, if you need healing, if you need salvation, Meaning, I'm giving my heart to you, Jesus. I'm, I'm returning it. I had to say to Jesus, I took my heart away from him once. He gives me the ability to do that. That's a scary ability to have. But I came to a point where I said, I don't, I don't want to be in control. And I gave it back. And maybe, maybe that's you today. Maybe you've never given him your heart. But I'm just going to ask you, if, if you need forgiveness, if you're in a trial, if you just love Jesus and you want more of him, if you want the Holy Spirit to speak to you, come down here as we sing this song. And we're going to worship the Lord. Come now as we sing. And Jesus over everything. He reigns forevermore. Yeah, Our song for all Move in close. Move in close. Yeah, people are coming. take it down for a moment. And I, Micah, would you lead us a cappella? That means just our voices. And I want you to do it from your heart because music can enhance, but sometimes we rely on it too much, right? But can you just make it your prayer as you sing this? And what you're doing is you're giving, you're giving him your trial because <laughs> you need him to fight for you right now, man. You need him. And he's there for you. And, and you're giving him your burden and you're surrendering your heart, and, and, and you're saying, it's, it's yours. Everything's yours. Lead us, bro. Sing it with us. Just your voice lifted to the Lord. And Jesus over everything, he reigns forevermore. Our song for all eternity. One more time with your voices. Jesus Christ is Lord. Oh, we sing, sing Jesus. And Jesus over everything. He reigns forevermore. Our song for all eternity. Christ is Lord. Okay, can, can you do this for me? I just want you, if you're going through a trial, 
and every, all of us go through trials. But man, we want to pray for you. If you're going through a trial, lift your hand. If you're sitting out there, down here, just lift your hand. If you're comfortable with it and you know how to pray, would you just step, step beside someone and lay a hand on them? Keep your hand up. Keep your hand up if you're going through a trial. Yeah, keep it up. You saw a hand even out there. Could just step towards someone, someone right here, right here. Pray with them. Someone right here. Someone pray right here. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You start to pray. Start to pray for these people who so desperately need the Lord to move into their circumstances. God, we can't do it alone. It's too much. We can't bear it. But you are the comforter. You are the one who brings peace. You are the one who brings strength in the midst of the trial. Let your spirit fall upon them so they would know that almighty God attends to them. Almighty God fights for them. Thank you, Jesus, that you love them. Thank you, Jesus, that you're with them. May they feel that you are with them. Take their hand and lead them, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Let's give Jesus a clap offering. He's doing his work.